Um, well, hello there and welcome to a Malford Chambers webinar on uh, an introduction to fitness pr to practice proceedings before the HCPC. My name is Anthony James and I was called to the bar in 2021 and I have a predominantly criminal defence and regulatory practice. I spent six months on secondment with the NMC case presenting last year uh, and I've now expanded my practice into defence briefs in other regulators, including the HCPC. I'm joined today by two very special guests. We're joined by Harjinder Sund from uh, Thompson Solicitors and also by Vanessa Reed from Chambers. And I'm going to pass over to Harjinder to introduce herself. Thank you. Um, my name is Harjinder Sund. I'm from Thompson Solicitors. Um, I specialise in professional regulatory and professional discipline um, practice. I qualified in 2008 as a solicitor. I've been working for Thompson since then. I deal with a number of regulators um, representing a number of registrants who face um, allegations being brought by regulators, um, including the HCPC, NMC, um, TRA, um, and GPHC, um, just to name a few. Thank you. Vanessa. Thank you. I am a barrister at Mountford Chambers as well, uh, specializing in crime and regulatory work. I spent a year on secondment at Kingsley Napoli, presenting almost exclusively HCPC cases, and now continue to take on regulatory work before the HCPC and NMC and other regulators. Thank you. I think it's probably a good idea, considering this is an introduction to, this, to practice proceedings before the HCPC, to just look briefly at what the HCPC is. HCPC stands for a Health and Care Professions Council, and it is the regulator for 15 different healthcare professions, covering every, anything from paramedics to podiatrists, psychologists, dietitians, um, to name but a few. And uh, what we're going to do today is take a topic each, essentially. And Harjinda is going to start by talking about when cases are investigated and the interim order stage of proceedings. She'll then hand over to me to talk about the preparation for the final hearing stage. And then Vanessa will talk about what actually happens at the final hearing and how sanction is decided in these cases. So I'm going to hand over now to Hojinda to speak about our first topic, which is when cases are investigated and interim orders. The HCPC um, uh, regulator of a num number of health professionals, um, their objectives are to protect the public, to uphold the confidence in the professions, um, and to set and to maintain standards um, of conduct for the members of those professions. So when a referral um, comes to the HCPC, they will make a decision on whether they need to investigate it. What they will look at is whether there is a risk to um, the public um, or whether the um, concerns raised would um, fall below the standards expected of that professional. So the referrals, first, first of all, can come from any source. So they could come from the employer, they can come from the member of a public, they can come from another organisation, uh, like the police. Uh, they can also come from the registrant themselves. There is an obligation on the registrant to self-refer uh, in, in certain circumstances, for example, um, if they are convicted of an offence. Um, so what they will um, look into and what they will investigate is whether the conduct of the registrant fell below the standards that is expected of them, um, if they are a risk to safety of the of, of public, service users, patients, colleagues, um, and if there is a risk to the public confidence in the profession. Each profession has a set of standards they are expected to follow. Um, the HCPC will investigate if they think those standards have been breached by the professional. When the HCPC carry out an investigation, they are assessing whether a registrant is fit to practice. What they will look at is issues not just in the workplace, but that can also be issues outside of, the, of, of their clinical practice, such as convictions and cautions, if they think that could undermine the public's confidence in the profession. So what they will look at, what the HCPC will look at, is whether the registrant is currently impaired, so whether their fitness practice is currently impaired. Um, 
on one of one or more of the following grounds. And those grounds are misconduct. So that could be a behavior that falls below the standards that is expected of them. It could be lack of competence. So those are um, the lack of knowledge or skills required to do the job. Um, and, and that's usually something that's over a period of time. So not just one off occasions, but regular um, errors being made. Um, convictions or cautions, um, physical or mental um, health concerns, which is in, which, which could be impacting their ability to practice safely, um, and a decision which has been made by another um, regulator, um, healthcare regulator. So those are the grounds that they will be looking at when they're doing an investigation. So what does the investigation involve? So the investigation will involve them um, initially getting the referral come through, whether that comes through on their, they have a um, an actual referral form, um, whether it comes through that or if it's come through on an email or whichever way it has come through. They will then consider how they're going to investigate, who are they going to speak to? Now, generally the first point of call would be the person who's made the referral, if within that referral they've identified other individuals, they may go and contact those individuals. If it is a case that it perhaps involves um, other organisations like an employer, they may contact the employer um, to obtain documents. If it's um, a case involving a police investigation, they would liaise with the police as well to find out at what stage their investigation is at and what um, you know information they're willing to share. Um, Part of the investigation, as I said, will involve them obtaining documents. Uh, the HCPC have got wider powers to obtain certain documents. So, for example, um, if they need to get access to patient notes because there's been a concern raised about record keeping, um, they and they need to get those from a particular organisation, a trust or a hospital, they can use their wider powers um, to request those documents. So they can have that have access to those documents um they will gather all of the information once they've gathered all of the information they've satisfied they have carried out uh, an investigation and they've obtained the, as much information as they possibly need they will set out um what the allegations are what the, what the issue the concerns are um and then send the documents and the allegations to the registrant the registrant then has um, 28 days to put a response in. Um, there is no obligation on the registrant to um, put a response in. It's, it's just simply a matter for the um, registrant to decide if they want to respond to the allegations or not at that stage. The, um, the, doc the investigation documents, the allegations and any response the registrant submits will then go before an investigating committee. The, yes, the investigating committee uh, meet in private. Um, it's a panel um, and they will make a decision on whether they think registrant has a case to answer. Um, they will not be making a decision on whether they think allegations um, have been proven. Um, and th th their role is to, to, to simply assess the weight of the evidence. Um, so is it likely or could a panel find those allegations proven at a final hearing based on the information that is before them? Um, they also have to look at even if even if they can't, could find those allegations proven, um, could they find impairment? So they do have to deal with those things separately. So, again, you may have a case where somebody has had issues um, in relation to um, competence, record keeping, but they've remedied that um, during the time of the investigation. So by the time it gets to investigating committee stage, there is no, um, they, they don't think it's likely a panel would find impairment and the case can be um, closed at that stage. Um, the investigating committee also have the power to refer it back to um, um, the investigation team to do further investigation if they don't think that they have done or obtained all the information um, that they could have. 
just in terms of time scales, um, if you are advising any clients, um, investigations can take um, anything between nine to twelve months, um, if not longer. So it's it's not a it's not a quick process. Um, they they are they are also known to put investigations on hold if other organisations are carrying out an investigation. For example, if an employer is still going through a disciplinary process or if um, the police are carrying out some type of criminal investigation. So they may put case on hold if the allegations are linked um, to, to, to the, to the um, concerns those other organisations are investigating. Um, that is generally the investigation process, um, what, what is involved, what they look at and the reasons why they will carry out an investigation. Um, as part of that, I'll move on to interim orders. So um, interim orders are generally put in place um, at the beginning of a case or when they first um, receive a referral. The HCPC will assess the seriousness of the concern. Um, interim orders are essentially a risk assessment. It's them saying, right, if we've got this really serious concern, um, do we need to put any restrictions in place while we carry out an investigation? Um, so the process itself is uh, the registrant is notified of the fact that they're considering an interim order and very quickly afterwards it will be listed for a hearing. You get about seven days notice um, of an interim order. It's done, it's done very quickly. Reason behind that is because it is a risk assessment. It's about managing risk and making sure there's no, no, no risk to patients and public. Um, so what 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 are the interim orders for? The interim order is is that it's it's to protect the public or um, maintain the public's confidence in the profession. So what the panel at uh, um, an interim order hearing won't be doing is making a decision on the facts. They don't they're not there to assess whether something's happened or whether allegations have been proven. They're there to ask the question. Um, if a member of the public were to find out, will were to find out that we allowed somebody to continue to practice while we knew there was these serious investigations going on, would the confidence in the in the profession be undermined? Or is there a risk that given the number of allegations or the type of allegations that have come up, that is there a risk that this could happen again? So do we need to put some restriction in place to make sure that we minimise that risk? So the type of order they can put in place, it's an interim suspension order. That's usually in more serious cases. So the type of cases you might see an interim suspension order is probably serious allegations of sexual misconduct. There might be a police investigation ongoing at the same time. Um, and the least restrictive um, order would be a conditions of practice, an interim conditions of practice order. Um, in that, yeah, that would be some type of restriction um, working under supervision. Um, or you know, having a regular having regular meetings um, with a, a manager to develop a, a plan and reporting back to the HCPC um, every few months and setting out that you know that you're achieving and what what they've asked. In, in the types of cases where you would have an interim conditions of practice order might be where you've had serious on, ongoing series of ongoing clinical errors for example, um, and somebody perhaps needs support in the workplace and they just need that, so they need some supervision. Interim orders are reviewed. Um, the HCPC review them first, the first review is after the first six months, and then they review them every three months after that. Um, the HCPC or the right registrant can ask for an early review if there's any new information which would materially change the need for the type of order that is in place. Um, currently, interim orders are all conducted virtually. If there's an interim suspension order in place, the HCPC are at the moment um, just dealing with them on the papers at the at the reviews, which is they will they will just make a decision on the papers without having a, a hearing. Um, but you can request a hearing if you think there's new information that we want to bring to the panel's attention, which might need, may be a need for um, 
changing the type of order that's in place. So interim orders um, also are usually imposed for 18 months, although they are reviewed in that 18 months, because um, that's the maximum amount of time the um, a panel can impose an order for. Um, at the end of that 18 months, if um, the HCPC want to extend the order, they have to make an application to the High Court to do so. Um, and it would be a matter for the registrant to decide whether they consent to that application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, that does seem to be a commonality among lots of regulators that they only have a power to impose those orders for a certain period and, and thereafter the High Court has to get involved. Well, that was a very interesting overview there of a stage of proceedings that we as council don't often get involved in, actually. So thank, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, we're going to turn to, to me now, and I'm going to talk about preparing for the final hearing, and Hajinda did speak about that um, briefly, about what, why a case gets to a final hearing. And indeed, that's what I'll start with. Um, cases come to a final hearing when that investigating panel has concluded that there's a realistic prospect um, of the facts alleged being proved and of there being um, misconduct or lack of competence and fits to practice impairment. The case will then come to a final hearing and Vanessa's going to talk about the structure of that. I'm going to talk about how best to prepare for those, particularly from the defence perspective, which is the perspective that I come at this from in terms of my HCPC work. I think the first stage for um, the solicitors when it comes to preparing for the hearing is to take full instructions from the client once the, uh, the draft bundles have been served on the defence. And what is helpful is to try to produce a first draft of a witness statement because these are quasi-civil proceedings. Witnesses of the HCPC will often adopt their witness statements as a evidence in chief. And indeed, the same can be said for the defence, for, for the registrant and for any defence witnesses that are called. And therefore, producing a um, concise but also thorough witness statement can be a, a real helpful tool in the arsenal of the um, advocate that's dealing with the case at the final hearing. So getting that first draft of the witness statement done is very useful uh, in terms of preparation. Then I'd recommend that solicitors instruct counsel um, as soon as they can in plenty of time. Uh, often, uh, the, certainly the work I've done with Argenda were instructed at least two months before the hearings, um, which is um, a, a very good time period to, to have to, to be able to fully consider the case and also go through the next steps I'm going to talk about. The first thing to do once counsel's instructed is to organise a conference between the solicitor, counsel and the registrant. And the important things to discuss at those conferences, in my view, is the content of the witness statement and the instructions that the registrant is given. Looking at those instructions and deciding whether it would be sensible to get some early admissions into any of the uh, allegations, because often, uh, I'm sure Vanessa will look at this when they're looking at sanction, fitness and practice impairment, etc. A registrant's understanding, insight, approach to the particulars, the allegations that they face is vital and a really key consideration. And therefore getting in early admissions can often be the difference between a finding of impairment or not, or a um, suspension and conditions of practice um, later down the line. So making those decisions early on is going to have a big impact when you come to the end of the case. Another important thing to discuss at that conference, in my view, would be reflective material. I like to split the registrant's material into a witness statement dealing with the factual allegations and then a witness statement of reflection about what's gone on, going through all of the allegations, the seriousness of them, what the impact would be on the um, on harm to the public, on public confidence, etc. And also, if you have that conference in plenty of time, that gives you the opportunity to recommend to the registrant any further work that they can do, both on reflection but also on um, remediation by taking part in um, courses on record keeping, for example, if that's one of the concerns that's been investigated, or, or, or whatever other remedi remediation work that they could be doing. Uh, and being able to advise on that as early as possible is, again, a key um, part of dealing with the case later down the line when it comes to impairment and sanction. Two things for the lawyers to consider at this stage, for counsel to advise on and, and for sisters to consider, would be redactions to the bundle. An awful lot of the time, the bundles that you get in, in all of the regulators will contain, in, not in necessarily inadmissible material, considering uh, how um, 
the, the, the laws work about that, but material that could be argued out of, of the bundles, whether that's prejudicial material, whether that's material that's hearsay, or whether that's opinion evidence. Uh, and that's certainly a huge issue that came up in the case between me and Harjinder, and I'll speak about the relevance of that in a moment. And I've written an article to the Chamber's website um, going through the various considerations on opinion evidence in regulatory proceedings, um, and also any other legal issues that might arise. Once you've considered those as the lawyers, it's then a good idea to propose those redactions to the other side, to the ACPC in this context, and um, give them a list of all the redactions that you want. They're likely to then respond with their position and they're likely to accept a lot of them um, if, if the bundles have never been redacted before, but it, they may dispute them as well. They may say that no, this hearsay evidence is admissible or this opinion evidence is admissible. And if that's the case and you, as the defence team really feel that that material shouldn't be in there, my view is the best way to deal with it is to ask the HCPC to list the matter for a preliminary hearing or meeting, as they're called. The benefit of that is you can stop the final panel seeing that material if you're successful in your legal arguments at the preliminary hearing, meeting, I should say. And also it does save time when you get to that final hearing because say a hearing's listed for seven days, that hearing will last seven days. It cannot go on like criminal cases do, on and on uh, after that time period. If you run out of time, the matter will go partnered and you'll have to come back months later when everybody's availability allows for it. And, and that's in nobody's interest. It's not in the interest of the HCPC witnesses. It's not in the interests of the registrants, particularly when this is hanging over their head. So being able to save time and get legal issues out early on, again, uh, in my view, is a very important um, thing to do. Once you've had that preliminary meeting, um, provided you've got all the uh, material that you wanted to, then the bundle should be ready to go. Uh, and then it's also time for you to finalise the registered bundle as well uh, and um, have that served on the HCPC prior to the hearing. Um, it's um, good courtesy, I suppose, and um, makes it, everything easier for everybody at that final hearing. And really, those th that's the final stage of the defence team. It then comes down to the um, advocate themselves to do their prep, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on this. Vanessa's going to talk about the structure of the hearing, but, but just in brief, we say they deal with factual allegations, then misconduct, lack of competence, for example, and then impairment and sanction. In the HCPC, which, is distinct in dis which, which can be distinguished from other regulators, they deal with um, facts, misconduct, and impairment all together, unless you ask for them to be separated. Um, and if you're dealing with all of those together, it is important that you are able to prep the points you want to make on your closing, on the facts, and on your submissions on misconduct and impairment at the start, because um, then you're going to be able to know exactly what it is you need to elicit in cross-examination. And just one final point, and this is a point that I raise in my article on, on opinion evidence. There seems to be an approach of the courts moving away from saying things are inadmissible towards saying things are admissible, but then you can deal with weight. And if you spot opinion evidence in that bundle, in my, in my view, one way of dealing with it is to try and cross-examine the person proffering that opinion to reduce the weight the panel's going to place on that. And that does take early identification of that opinion evidence and also does take quite a lot of preparation in, in deciding how to do a cross-examination. And that's a really good thinking on your feet, which... <laughs> I can't say I am. I certainly need to prep it. So I hope that's a helpful outline of really more of a defence perspective on how to um, approach preparation for the final hearing. And now we're going to move on to what actually happens at the final hearing and how sanctions decide. Thank you. So I'll, I'll make a few notes first about some of the practicalities of a final hearing. First of all, um, these days, essentially since the pandemic, most HCPC final hearings are virtual as a matter of course, unless either the registrant or the HCPC requests otherwise. This may be the case if it's a particularly complex case, there are vulnerable witnesses or registrant, or, or if the registrant requests it, but it will be virtual unless you have heard otherwise. So do if that's something that someone is concerned about, that's something to um, speak to the HCPC about early on. Otherwise expect that you'll be sent a link um, even for um, a final hearing. So something else that's helpful to know if you've never seen a final hearing is who is present at that final hearing. First of all, there will be the three panel members. Uh, that includes a registrant panel member, 
usually a member of the same profession as the registrant, a lay member and a panel chair. This three person panel decide all the issues of fact and law during the course of the final hearing. They are assisted by a legal assessor, uh, which we you might hear us refer to as an LA, but that's, I'll try and say legal assessor so we can keep track of too many acronyms. This is a legally qualified person who provides independent legal advice to the panel on questions of law. They also provide guidance throughout the hearing on the law to all parties involved during the hearing. They're independent of the panel and they merely give advice. They don't make any decisions about legal issues, but they do very much guide uh, legal issues as they arise. There will be a hearings officer or an HO. This is essentially the court clerk. They play a significant role in keeping the hearing running. They make everything happen behind the scenes. They schedule the witnesses, distribute the documents, communicate with the parties, let everyone know about the timings, uh, deal with broken links. So that's, a, you know, you want to make sure you have their contact information. They should be the one reaching out to you but that will be a very important person to be in contact with for all people involved in the final hearing. There is the HCPC case presenter who represents the HCPC at the hearing, presents the case, and they're acting on instructions from HCPC case managers. There is of course the registrant, and then there's the registrant's representative, if any. You've heard the perspective of a hearing that is prepared as, as you might hope it would be with diligent solicitors, diligent counsel, everyone having many conferences in advance. And ideally that is how it would go. Unfortunately, uh, registrants are not entitled to be represented at these hearings and they will not be unless they can come up with some kind of funding. So there are various safeguards in place for what happens when a registrant is not represented. Um, but of course that makes everything um, more complicated and sometimes slower because it's very important, of course, to make sure that the registrant understands what's happening and have their interests represented if they don't have their own representative. Um, to that end, um, what happens also before the final hearing is usually various pre-hearing conferences, um, as with any kind of hearing. Um, but in this case, you'll have the case presenter, you'll have the legal assessor, you'll often have the hearings officer, You'll confirm that everyone has the right documents, all the bundles have been distributed, everyone has the right versions of the bundles, the right page counts. If there are additional defense materials coming or additional HCPC materials coming, that has been known to happen all around, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and that again, of course, if, um, if the registry is unrepresented, this is the time when everyone will sit down with them, um, the LA and the case presenter will both be there. Um, to make sure they understand what will happen. Um, it's important at this stage that the legal, the legal assessor will always speak to the registrant with the case presenter present. They don't go off and have their own conferences. And in particular, the legal assessor has to be very careful that the registrant understands that they're not being represented by the legal assessor, because of course, this is a legally trained person giving them legal advice, perhaps asking them about what sounds like taking instructions. So this is a very uh, delicate, um, issue that registrants really understand that if they do not have their own representative, there is no one in that hearing who is actively representing their interests, but everyone else, it, it puts a duty on the case presenter, the panel and the LA to ensure that their interests are being uh, adequately safeguarded. And in fact, all of those people have a duty to, to raise any issues that might be in the registrant's interest. This is not a, and, and they should, and in fact, they, they have an ethical obligation to do so. So this is not a, is not and should not be a cutthroat uh, situation where registrant is not represented. Um, hopefully, however, they will be represented like by someone like Anthony, represented, uh, instructed by someone like Rajinder, and, and that will all go a lot more easily. But that is certainly an issue that arises often. Um, everyone, represented or not, everyone will discuss if there are any outstanding preliminary issues. Again, ideally, all these will have been dealt with at a preliminary meeting you already have hashed out issues of hearsay, admissibility, any potential amendments to allegations, uh, privacy applications, uh, perhaps discontinuance of an allegation. However, it certainly many, many times you'll arrive at the day of the final hearing and all these issues will sort of bubble up and they can be dealt with and often are dealt with on the first day of the hearing. So that needs to be dealt with. That needs to be identified as soon as possible, discussed, any agreements that can be reached should be because it takes a lot of time to suddenly have to deal with all these preliminary legal issues. Um, it happens a lot, but it really does slow down hearing. So 
everyone involved who can identify those issues in advance and, and get ahead of it, it really does save time. So, but how often the next thing that will happen is preliminary applications. So you make those applications, the panel will decide on them, you know, minor, arguably, sometimes uh, that's disputed, uh, amendments to the allegations, or again, issues of admissibility that can't be agreed, whether or not a hearing will be conducted in, in whole or in part in private. As a default, hearings are, of course, uh, held in public because uh, principles of open justice apply to these proceedings as well. But it's not unusual for there to be an application for parts to be held in private, particularly when they touch on issues of health, uh, children, vulnerable people, either registrants or witnesses. So that's all, those are all issues to be alive to. Um, at long last, uh, the panel will decide all of those issues. Everyone will be very happy that everything is squared away uh, and the final hearing will finally begin. Um, the HCPC will open the case, set out the background facts, uh, remind everyone of what the allegations are to be proven and give a summary of the evidence to be presented. Anthony has mentioned um, the stages of the case, but the, a final hearing is divided into four stages, although not all stages will be reached in all cases. There's the fact stage, the grounds, the impairment stage, and sanctions. Um, Anthony's mentioned this, um, but it will be a matter of case management for the panel to decide whether to hear all the first three together to hear facts, grounds, and impairment, and then hear submissions and make a decision or whether to break up those stages. And that will be very much guided by the nature of the case. There's some cases where grounds simply follow on from facts. If this is a matter of whether or not there's been a criminal conviction done, that the grounds are already established, there's generally no need to have a separate discussion about it. Sometimes uh, grounds are hotly contested, sometimes even once facts are established, um, it's very much a matter for submissions, whether or not it amounts to misconduct, uh, so in those cases, it may make sense to divide up the stages, but the panel will often default to hearing them all together unless um, it's raised at the beginning. So it's important to, to think through whether this is a case that needs to be divided up. Um, this is also important to discuss at the beginning because it will often affect what evidence is elicited from witnesses and um, in particular, the registrant's evidence. Um, it's quite typical if the, if the registrant is someone who is going to give oral evidence that they will come back later to address issues of impairment if we reach that stage, because of course it's not a given um, that you'll reach the impairment stage. And um, there might be very different things that a registrant might wish to say once it's been established that the facts are proven. Um, so these are all case management issues that should be thought through and discussed with the panel and both parties at the beginning so that there's no kind of screeching moment where someone's asked a question that they shouldn't be asked. Um, or material isn't covered that should be covered. Um, so once that's decided, you'll proceed to the fact stage. Um, that's when the HCPC presents evidence in support of their factual allegations. Um, and then the panel determines whether the facts have been alleged, uh, facts alleged have been proven on the balance of the probabilities. The burden to prove those facts is of course on the HCPC. Um, the HCPC will generally, but not always call live witnesses. Um, as Anthony has mentioned, um, it's very common for witnesses to adopt their written witness statements at the start of, of the proceedings, I think almost inevitably. And then questions asked will be to amplify or clarify anything in those statements. Um, they can be questioned by the case presenter, cross-examined by the registrant or the registrant's representative. And then the panel can also ask all witnesses questions. And then there's an opportunity for both parties to re-examine uh, about any issues arising. So it's a much more dynamic process. I mean, the panel really can explore almost you know, anything that they're interested in hearing about. So it's not always, uh, the questioning isn't always as carefully cabined as perhaps it is in, in criminal cases. Sometimes the panels do go exploring issues that they'd like to know more about. And that's something again for all representatives and the legal assessor also to, to be mindful of um, whether all questions are proper from anyone who gets to question. So the, the HCPC presents its evidence. Um, at the close of the HCPC's uh, presentation of the factual evidence, there is of course an opportunity for the registrant or representative to consider any um, submissions of no case to answer. Um, it's also entirely possible to make submissions of no case to answer about grounds or impairment as well. And that's something that representatives should consider that it's entirely possible to say there's simply no 
possibility that a panel could realistically find that this rises to the um, to misconduct, even if um, you find that the facts are proven. So that's something strategic for representatives to consider at all those stages. After the HCPC's case, the registrant um, presents their case or, or the representative um, that there's typically a bundle. Um, sometimes they have witness statements. Sometimes they bring their own witnesses and they're entitled to do so. The registrant um, makes a decision about whether or not to give live evidence or not. And that's entirely their own decision. Of course, if they do give evidence, they can be cross-examined by the case presenter and questioned by the panel. Um, this is a particularly important decision in HCPC and all regulatory cases, because of course the panel is not simply considering um, the factual allegations, but also insight, um, current impairment. And those are issues that can really come through through live evidence sometimes um, even more strongly than in written materials. Um, so it, it, it does just depend on the facts of the case, the registrant, um, and, and, and all those considerations. But it's certainly something that registrants should consider carefully um, in spite of how stressful these types of proceedings are. And often that's something that a registrant struggles to decide um, whether or not they're potentially up for. Uh, So that's the fact stage. And again, we're presuming um, we're not going to break up these stages, but at the end of each stage, it's possible to make written or oral submissions um, but for both parties. And it's quite common for there to be some written submissions prepared. And again, the main um, thing for advocates to bear in mind is simply communicate with all parties and the panel regarding whether you'd like to make submissions, whether you anticipate making written submissions, what stage you'd like, at what stage you'd like to do that. And they generally are, are quite flexible about that, but it just helps everyone move things along if they know that. Um, whether it's heard at the same time or after a decision has been made about whether the factual allegations have been proven, the next stage is grounds. Harjinder has mentioned what those grounds are, but just to remind you, there are five statutory grounds on which a registrant's fitness to practice may be found to be impaired. That's misconduct, lack of competence, a conviction or caution for criminal offense, physical or mental health, or determination by another regulator. The, those, those types of hearings will look very different. And so you'll become familiar with what um, each of those grounds sort of, what the issues arising are. Um, but misconduct again will be likely to be sort of a serious falling short or some kind of active wrongdoing. A lack of competence again tends to be kind of a consistent falling short of um, the skills necessary to do the job. Um, a conviction or caution is quite different, um, and that's one where generally, once it's been proven, um, you know that the statutory ground has been made out. Physical or mental health um, is very different, and uh, again, yeah, often very sensitive issues arising, and it's good to be mindful of going into private um, hearings for, for parts of those discussions. That's almost a matter of course in those cases. Um, and then it's, it's more unusual, but certainly does come up with determination by another regulator. Um, so again, I've mentioned, but um, sometimes misconduct will be hotly contested. And it's at this stage, you're not likely to hear more evidence, but submissions on misconduct, misconduct is the, is the one where there's most room for argument, I, I would suggest. Um, you'll hear case law, you'll hear sort of submissions on both sides about how serious was this really? Um, was this simply a lapse or a true falling short? What kind of impact did this conduct have perhaps on service users or colleagues? So these are the kinds of issues that um, where advocates and advocacy can make a real difference. And so these are issues to be alive to, but not just assuming that once the facts are proven that um, this conduct will follow as a matter of course, that's simply not always the case. So be prepared to make submissions on that um, when the time comes. So then the, the panel will make a decision regarding whether or not the statutory ground is made out. And if, if they do find that it is, they'll move on to impairment. Um, this is also a critical phase for, for advocates on both sides. Um, the HCPC doesn't tend to make, uh, doesn't tend to present any additional evidence here. Again, the registrant may come back and give evidence um, and so the HCPC will cross-examine them, but this is not a place where the HCPC has, you know, they'll, they'll bring the panel's attention to uh, what they've heard, what the panel might wish to consider to the relevant guidance, but this is a place where registrants really 
uh, can make a big difference. There's there's a lot of evidence that can be presented by a registrant. Um, this is you, you heard Anthony talk about um, what you might be the materials a registrant might prepare. This is where you'll you'll really see them. This is where you get testimonials from colleagues, service users, supervisors. Where this is where registrants really will want to show what have they been doing in the time since these allegations arose? Have they fixed the problem? Have they done continuing education? Um, you'll often see reflective statements saying, you know, where they'll show insight into what went wrong, how they can ensure that this won't happen again. And again, um, reasonable minds may differ and this is a matter of strategy, but I think it's certainly when a registrant gives live evidence here and submits to questioning by the panel, it is a good opportunity to really demonstrate uh, the distance between um, what was happening at the time of the allegations and where they are today. Um, because of the important thing about impairment, and I think um, Arjinda really touched on this, is that it is forward-looking. Um, something may have gone wrong in the past, but the question for the panel is, is this uh, registrant impaired today? And so all, all of this information can help them decide, are, do they genuinely represent um, an ongoing risk to the public, or is this something that, um, while there may have been a falling short, um, it does not rise to the level of current impairment. There is excellent and helpful guidance that having HCPC impairment policy, well, all of these um, stages have great, um, very straightforward guidance on the HCPC website. So all practitioners should take a look at that in preparing a case. Um, but you'll, you'll see in the guidance that um, impairment will generally arise um, or be found when a practitioner presents a risk to service users, has brought the profession into disrepute, has breached one of the fundamental tenets of the profession, or has acted in such a way that their integrity can no longer be relied on. So those are the issues that a registrant will want to be sort of addressing and kind of tailoring their submissions to, and that is where the HCPC will be needing to show that not simply that something went wrong in the past, but that here, here today, this person um, has brought the profession into disrepute or genuinely presents a risk to service users. So that so that's I think what to say about the impairment stage. But again, there's there's lots of ways to approach it. But looking at what the panel will be considering is how how you should go about preparing for that. If a panel does find that the uh, practitioner's uh, fitness to practice is currently impaired, then you move on to the fourth stage, sanctions. We've mentioned the sanction stage is never included. Um, with the other stages, that will always be something that is not addressed until, um, unless and until impairment is found. Um, at the stage that a panel finds a registrant's fitness to practice is currently impaired, um, you'll, they'll hear about sanctions from both parties. Um, again, great guidance set out on the HTPC website, but in brief, you know, what, what both parties will be reminding the panel that the touchstone of sanctions in these cases is that they're not intended to punish registrants, but instead ensure the public is protected. Um, so it, it's very, there's a, an approach set out in the guidance, which is that the, the sanctions, um, the panel should only take the minimum action necessary to ensure the public is protected. This means considering the least restrictive sanction available to them first and only moving on to a more restrictive sanction if it is in fact necessary to protect the public. So a panel doing a thorough job will, will start essentially at the least restrictive um, sanction and go up in seriousness. They, they should never simply say, this is a very serious case and so we're striking off. They, they should methodically go through each sanction and give reasons for why it's not adequate in that case. And they really do have to do that. And so they should be reminded of that at this stage. Um, the available sanctions that a panel must consider are no action. Um, they're actually not required to impose a sanction. It's entirely possible for them to find that a finding of impairment is a sufficient sort of marker of the seriousness of the case. And that in this case, no particular action is needed to mark, um, to do more to protect the public. This is actually a point at which they may consider whether an interim order was already in place. And this is where, again, I, a representative for the defense may, may remind them if an interim order has been in place for 18 months that you know, whatever measures have needed to be taken perhaps have already been taken and they can take that into account. It is possible for them to simply take no action and that does happen. Um, the next most serious sanction is a caution. After that, they consider whether a conditions of practice order might be needed um, that's again a place where if 
if a, a conditions of practice order seems like a realistic possibility, a submissions by the defense on what is what is realistic, what is uh, measurable, what what is practical. Um, it, it's very important that a panel not impose conditions which simply are not practical to carry out and which it's not possible for a registrant to easily demonstrate whether or not they're complying with them. So there are a number of sort of um, templates for, for conditions which should be considered and uh, practitioners should consider making submissions about really what is realistically needed here and narrowly, ta narrowly tailor tailoring any conditions to the genuine risk in that case. Um, if the panel feels that conditions of practice simply can't address um, their concerns, they may consider a suspension order um, and then the most serious is a striking off order. Someone can be permanently struck from the register if they feel that that is the only way to address the uh, misconduct at issue in the case. Um, but again, as I say, that sanctions must be proportionate. Um, the panel will be reminded that they must strike a balance between the competing interests of the registrant and the overriding objective to protect the public, and that the registrant's interests um, really do need to weigh in that balance as well. And decisions on sanctions should be fair, just, and reasonable. So um, I think there's always more to be said about that, but I, hopefully that kind of gives an overview of how, how sanctions will be decided in these cases. So. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and thank you, Arjinda. That brings us to the end of our webinar on an introduction to fitness to practice proceedings before the HCPC. We hope that's been a helpful introduction to the considerations, um, both before the matter gets to the final hearing and then um, in the preparation to it and when it finally gets there. Um, there's plenty more resources on um, our Chamber's website and also on um, Thompson Solicitor's website, I'm sure, Arjinda. Um, so I'm sure, sure that'll be useful for everybody. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in.